It's um, my opportunity to share with you a bit about where we are, where we've been, and where I hope we're going. I just first want to say that I'm really glad you're all here. It's great to be here gathered together, and once again, I'm very, very thankful for uh, St. Clement's and um, uh, hosting us and uh, allowing us to, to meet in this place. It really is kind of central for everybody. It's probably about the closest point. If we all have to come together, uh, this is about the closest point for all of us to do that. Even though some of us are still traveling five, six hours, uh, it's still uh, it's good to be here. I've just recently returned from the College of Bishops and um, share with you just briefly uh, what we are doing uh, at the college. We spent a lot of our time discussing a very contentious issue, and that is the issue of overlapping jurisdictions. We in the Southwest, uh, when I became bishop, we had, of course, uh, Bishop Wynne Mott's diocese was overlapping. We still have a couple small congregations that um, uh, belong to Wynne that have not moved, even though they're geographically in our area, particularly in West Texas, uh, a couple small congregations. Um, but by and large, uh, for example, Deming would be one that has decided to come over and join us fully. They kind of had a foot in Wynne's diocese and a foot in our diocese, but they're uh, now uh, fully part of our diocese. Um, and then uh, we also overlap with, of course, Cana, and that you have um, uh, St. Francis here, which is uh, Bishop Orgy's cathedral, is right here in El Paso. And, um, and that's a decent-sized congregation, um, but it is with Cana, uh, which is the Nigerian branch of uh, uh, the ACNA. Um, and we also have a church in Las Cruces, uh, that is Cana. Um, and then we also have an Albuquerque uh, um, uh, Trinity in the Marketplace, which is also Cana. So we do have overlapping jurisdictions here. Um, and it's not causing us too much problems because uh, Bishop Orgy and I get along pretty well. Uh, I got along great with uh, Bishop Wynn, still uh, call him from time to time. And as long as the bishops get along and, and play nice together, uh, it tends to work out. If the bishops don't play nice together, which happens in some places, it, it can be messy. And so the college, in essence, decided that the best thing we could do is establish a protocol that we're interestingly calling a covenant as to how we will relate to each other. That if you're gonna plant a church in somebody's geographic diocese, you need to talk to them. And um, just kind of get, get buy-in, get support, uh, so that it's not a hostile takeover kind of thing. Um, and that's uh, basically what the covenant is about, establishing those protocols. And since it is a contentious issue, basically where it really gets messy is if you have a geographic diocese abutting or there is a, an affiliated diocese that also claims that area, then you in essence have two bishops that are fighting over the same territory. And that's where it gets a, a bit messy. Um, we're hoping to resolve that. On the other hand, I don't see it going away any time in the near future. And in the meantime, if we can all play nice together, that was what we spent a lot of our time doing, establishing those protocols. And if you have any more questions about that, just come and grab me. The other issue that is hot on the table, especially given the Kavanaugh confirmation right now and given what's going on in the Roman Catholic Church and given what's going on with uh, some of the larger evangelical uh, congregations is the issue of uh, sexual harassment, uh, sexual impropriety in churches. And I just give you one word from Foley Beach that he passed on to us bishops that I pass on to you. Don't do anything stupid. <laughs> I repeat it. Don't do anything stupid. 
We live in a culture where far too many people are doing just that. Stupid things. To give you an idea of how serious the College of Bishops is taking it, um, Foley asked us to sign on to something called Covenant Eyes. Some of you might be familiar with it, but it is a program that you sign up for that monitors your computer. So that uh, you sign up for it and you also sign up with an accountability partner. So I am doing it with Bishop Keith Andrews of Western, uh, Western States. And uh, if I would go on my computer and go to a porn site, it will immediately show up on Keith's computer. And Keith will call me and say, Zimmerman, what are you doing? Um, and likewise, if he would do the same, it would show up on my computer and I call Keith and we act as accountability partners for each other. This is a huge issue because many, many clergy are addicted to online pornography. Clergy. I'm not talking about Joe and the pews. I'm talking about clergy are addicted to online pornography. And so the college is committing to hold each other accountable by doing that. That could find its way at some point in time dropping down to the diocesan level. Uh, right now it's at the College of Bishops level. The other piece, there's two pieces that we have to do. Gus and I will be working by October uh, to send in what our diocesan policy is on uh, sexual abuse and um, uh, uh, improprieties. And uh, we've been uh, working with uh, uh, John Guernsey. We're working with John Guernsey and his diocese. John has a pretty good protocol and we're modifying uh, John's uh, to fit our needs here in New Mexico and Texas. And um, uh, so we'll be publishing that, but we also need to get it on our website. What we need immediately to get on the website is that uh, the protocol, if you feel th that there has been an incident you need to be go, able to go on the website and it says, first you contact, ding, ding, then you contact, ding, ding, and here's, here's the process that will happen. You will be assigned an advocate. The, the person who's being accused will be assigned an advocate and we'll go through the process and we'll explore the whole thing and get it out in the open. And then we have to get ahead of the curve on it because the culture, as you know, is it's just such a huge issue right now in our culture. And so unless we're prepared, then if something, God forbid, would happen in the diocese, uh, we are extremely liable. And so we need to get ahead of the curb. In the meantime, and forever, don't <laughs> do <laughs> anything <laughs> stupid. stupid. <laughs> um, please, please, please. Um, and that includes on your uh, computer and, and what you watch. I ask you to really... Um, have holy eyes. So uh, that's important. Another thing that happened is uh, this has been distributed. This is a, a small version of the new prayer book that is coming out. This is actually published right now. It's called Text for Common Prayer 2. Uh, you can get it at the Anglican Liturgy Press. It's $12 a pop. If you would choose to get it, it has in it uh, the Daily Office, the Great Litany, Holy Eucharist in uh, both versions. Um, it has all the pastoral rites, occasional prayers and thanksgivings, collects, calendars, and lectionaries. Uh, so it, what it would do in essence, the, of course the one that you use the most is uh, the Holy Eucharist. It would be in here. And it's nice to get your hands on because these forms are are probably what we're going to be using. It's in the format that the new prayer book will be in. Uh, so you can see the format, the typeface, and that sort of thing. Uh, if you're just curious too, you can get your hands on a copy as clergy, but if you want to do it for congregations, smaller congregations especially, it wouldn't be too horrible a, a, a cost uh, to be able to do that. Um, and it gets a prayer book in your hands, which is, is kind of nice. So. 
Um, one of the things that we would like to move toward in the diocese, uh, to give you a hint, we have wrestled at standing committee because standing committee is very large with a, a big group. And um, it's really hard to do business when you've got such a big group, especially when you're on the phone. And so we are looking then at, at trying to find ways to, to shrink that size and be a little bit more effective. One of the things we realize we know we have to do that we would like to do, and that's coming up very soon, is uh, that we want to have three face-to-face -face meetings. We get much more accomplished when we meet face-to-face. -face. And um, I want to be working on some of the issue that Flavio has brought up, and that is the culture has changed. And what are we going to do to address uh, the change in the culture? Um, one of the things that I want to do is, that's what this book is about. This book is called Canoeing the Mountains, and it was highly recommended to me by Bishop Neil Labar. And the title is Canoeing the Mountains. Where does that come from? Well, it comes from the Lewis and Clark expedition. And Lewis and Clark, uh, when they set out, Thomas Jefferson commissioned them to find the passage all the way across the United States. And the vision was is that as they come up to the Continental Divide, on this side, you can get there by river. And so canoes, and you can get up to the top of the Continental. And the vision was we're going to get to the other side of the Continental Divide, and we'll be able to go down by river all the way to the Pacific, and won't it be lovely, and we'll canoe, and, and we'll get there. Well, as they got there, all of a sudden, one day they woke up, and in the mist was the Rocky Mountains. And they suddenly, their vision of what they were going to be able to do had totally changed. Uh, we're not going to be able to carry our canoes up the Rocky Mountains, and we don't know if there's a river on the other side anyway, and so canoes are useless. And this is also coming from a talk uh, of Father Tom. Uh, Thomas uh, uh, brought in Mark Eldridge. And a lot of what Mark talks about is also in this book. Uh, I talk about it in terms of standing committee because I'll be getting a copy of this book into all your hands um, so that we can... Um, it's not just about canoeing the mountains, but it's about what's going on in the church because the church has found itself in the same way. Mark Eldridge talks about back when, after World War II, when the soldiers came back, everybody wanted to go to church. So the big thing you did was you find out where everybody is moving to, and you look in a residential area, and you buy a piece of property, you build a, a church, and the next thing you knew, it was full. And everybody was a happy camper. That world no longer exists. After that, the church largely then moved to an attractional model whereby we will find a ministry within the church or we will get a great music team or we'll have a particularly strong uh, pulpit or something that's inside the church, great potlucks, whatever it is. Something that's inside the church will advertise that and they will come or maybe a really beautiful building, or, uh, and, uh, and that worked for a while. Um, a modern version of that to a degree of an attractional model is the big box churches with the light shows and the big bands, and they still are attracting some. Uh, well, some of them are actually attracting pretty big numbers, um, but eventually that attractional model is running up against a headwind. And the headwind is this, our culture has shifted. He uses a quote in here where he says that in the old days on Sunday, it was expected that everybody goes to church. And your kids wake up and they might fuss at you a little bit, but you say, the family goes to church on Sunday. Now we live in a culture in which on Sunday morning, the kids get up and they go play soccer. And the parents actually say, don't say, you're going to church whether you like it or not. The parents say, I think you can learn more about life on the soccer field than you can in the church. That's a huge shift. That our culture has actually moved and is now no longer 
seeing the benefit of Christianity, but has actually moved to a position that is hostile to Christianity and thinks you can learn more about your relationships to your fellow human beings on a soccer field than you can sitting in a pew studying the Word of God on Sunday morning. That's a huge shift to translate it into Lewis and Clark terms. One day we woke up and we saw the Rocky Mountains and we were carrying canoes. Now I want to be fair to you guys. You guys went to seminary with me. I was trained in the old ways. I was trained in the old ways that we do church. That if we And as Anglicans, let's be honest, I think a lot of us thought, you know, we left the Episcopal Church, and we left the Episcopal Church and we knew we needed to. And we've still got a great Anglican liturgy, and we believe the Word of God, and we're still teaching and preaching the Word of God. And so all we need to do is have an Anglican liturgy and preach the Word, and and they're going to be busting down the doors. Did that happen? It's not what I've seen. It's not what I've seen. And what happened was is that the, the sand underneath our feet shifted radically and the world changed almost overnight. So that now Christianity, like I say, was seen in a hostile light. And please hear me, guys, because I'm living through this with you. What are we going to do with that? What do you do then with the changes? And that's why Flavio's question, the world has changed, the culture has changed. How are we going to adapt to be able to meet that need? The good news is I think there's answers out there. They may not be the answers we want to hear, but the answers are there. And so I have hope. And that is, I want, and that's what I need, I want to have hope. I want to see some light on the other side of the wall, on the other side of the Rocky Mountains. I don't think we need to necessarily have a river that's going to flow into the Pacific so it's all smooth sailing, and it's not going to be, folks. It's going to be hard work. But I think there's ways to get over the mountain. And I think there's ways then to continue. Because God has promised, as Flavio pointed out, That if we go, if we are missional, if we're obedient to the mission of the church, he will be with us. And if he is with us, the gates of hell shall not prevail against us. But we've got to be adaptive. We've got to be willing to change. And that's a lot what the conference that Thomas uh, brought Mark Eldridge in, I, I thought it was excellent, and we might need to look at it again, but we'll be processing it through this because most of what Eldridge is talking about is in here. I'll tell you another point, and uh, I was not able to attend all the sessions, the special sessions that we had, but I went to Travis's, and uh, talk up Travis right here. But Travis is... Um, To me, a relatively young guy. Um, (laughs) Travis still has all his hair and it hasn't gone white yet. Um, But Travis, um, I think, has some good pointers on how to crack the code. The hard news is is that a lot of the answers that Travis is discovering, I think he would share with you, um, it doesn't look quite like what church used to look like. And we might have to be willing to go there and adapt that um, in order to, to reach the next generation of Christians. Stephen, there's Stephen in the back. Stephen uh, is a blessing in our diocese in that he's working at, at the, for the whole ACNA on working with youth groups and, and trying to establish uh, a youth culture within the ACNA. We need it desperately. But here's the statistic. And I want you to think about this. If an individual has not given their life to Jesus Christ by the time they're 22, then chances are they never will. Here's the next thing you need to look at. Look in our churches. Who's there? Folks that look like me. Or folks that look like Stephen. (laughs) 
So if our churches, the people that are coming are older, and you've got to get somebody before they're 22, here's the next question. Are our churches doing an effective job of making disciples and bringing people to Jesus Christ? No. That means we need some new models. We need to be adaptive. We need to ditch the canoes and the paddles and start looking for new ways uh, to do church. Um, the things that I'm hearing that Travis, and I, I don't want everybody busting down Travis's door because we've got other valuable programs that are going to be going on too, but um, if you get an opportunity to go to Travis's program, think about it. Um, I'd, I'd love you to think about and seeing what he's doing here at St. Clement's with some new models. Uh, I'll caution you. He's going to give you about eight new models, and it looks like he's doing them all at one time, and actually right now he is, but when he started, it starts with one. And a lot of you churches might say, well, that's easy for St. Clement's to do because St. Clement's has all these resources and this big building and all this money, but... Um, you can do it in a small church. You can do it in a church of 10 people. Uh, all the programs that Travis is, is, is advocating for. It takes a lot of work for the 10 or 12 people that you have, but you can do them one at a time. And the good news is, is as you would do some of these, uh, some of the, the things that Travis is doing and building relationships the way that he's doing it, it uh, gives an opportunity to be able to move forward. The bottom line is the kids and young parents are not sitting in our pews. And the answer is not going to be to try to get them sitting in our pews. The answer is we've got to go out there where they are and build those relationships. And once we build those relationships, then we can start speaking into their lives and sharing, uh, opening up opportunities to be able to share our faith and share the Lord Jesus Christ with these people. Let me give you a story which I'm, I've been reading that I'm seeing now for, uh, through new eyes uh, for the first time, and that is this. This is in Matthew chapter 22. Uh, this is in a parable that Jesus said. Jesus spoke to them in parables, and again he said, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent the servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. And again he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fat calves have been slaughtered, everything is ready, come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention. They went off, one to his farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his servants and treated them shamefully and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops, and he destroyed those murderers, and burned down their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And the servants went out into the roads and they gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. I've always read that story, and I think probably most of you have read that story, that the ones who showed up, the ones who were invited, were the Jews. And we read that story, and we read it back 2,000 years ago, and we say, those dingling Jews, there they had an opportunity to come to the wedding feast. Jesus, the bridegroom, was right there, and they blew it, and that just makes me mad at those dingling Jews, and I'm glad I'm not one of them, and let's go home and uh, have our Thanksgiving turkey, or whatever it is, okay. And so that's how we read that. And I'm reading that now, and it says, you know, the wedding feast is there. And lots of people are invited. This is the attractional model. The fatted calf has been slayed. The sacrifice is made. Come to church. Come join in the wedding feast of the Lamb. And who showed up? Nobody. They were all playing soccer on Sunday morning, okay? So nobody is coming. And that's the situation we find ourselves. Interestingly, we say it's all about the Jews in the first century 
I think we actually find ourselves today, now, in a situation that's very similar. The world resembles the world of the first century Christianity, where Christianity was seen as, they were known as people who eat babies, okay? And, and because of the flesh and drink my blood stuff and, and that sort of thing. So that was the rumor, that Christians sacrificed babies and drank their blood and, and you don't want to have anything to do with them. And we were despised. We were hated. We weren't good Roman citizens because we didn't worship their pantheon of many gods. We had our one little god and said that was the real one. Um, and so we were, we were despised in that culture. That's why they crucified Christians, not just Jesus. They crucified them and lit them on fire for street, street lights. I mean, that, that's what the Roman, or fed them to lions for entertainment. That, that's the kind of world that they lived in. It was a hostile world. And so you have in, even in here, and they took some of his servants, the church, they took some of his servants and they mistreated them and they beat them up and they uh, did all that kind of thing. And that's what happened in the early church. And the Jews did it, but the Romans did it. The whole world was pretty hostile to Christianity. We find ourselves in a world much like that again today. And, but I want you to notice one word there. And it's a word Travis used. And it's a word Flavio used. And it's a word that I want all of us to get a handle on. Go. Don't, it's not come, you're invited. It's to the servants, Go to the highways, to the byways, beat the bushes, bring them in. And I love even the concept that says, bring them in good and bad. And particularly, we're going to talk about that at the ordination too. What does that look like? So often we get in our minds, I want to bring in good Christian people into my church. Well, that's not what Jesus would have wanted. He would have wanted the last, the least, and the lost. Not the good Christian people. He wanted the broken people. He wanted the sinners. He wanted the prostitutes. He wanted the tax collectors. He wanted those who did not know him to fall in love with him. And so he's sending out the servants then to go. Go out where the people are. Go, go, go. Think even with go back to Abraham. It's fascinating when you start looking at Abraham, the father of the faithful people of God. What's the first thing that God does when he gets a hold of Abraham? First word, go. Go to the place that I tell you. He doesn't even tell him where it is. He says, when you get there, I'll kind of let you know. Um, my GPS will kick in and let you know where you're supposed to go, but just go. Go. Think of Moses. Go down, Moses, way down to Egypt land. Tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. 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 Christianity is a movement about going. The disciples only followed Jesus for a period of time so that they could become apostles. And an apostle, by definition in the Greek, is apostello, one who is sent from, somebody who goes. We're kind of in the mode, and I, and I have nothing wrong with being disciples, okay? We need to be disciples first, followers of Jesus Christ. But too often it's about, we need to be sheep and we need to come to church so we can be fed. I think the Old Testament prophets had quite a bit to say about fat sheep. And it was never good. And yet we all want to be fed. No, we need to go. Go, not come to church and be fed. We need to go. And we need to be spreading the gospel. We need to be getting out. I love, once again, I keep on borrowing what Travis said, but it really spoke to me. And that was, he said, so often we have this model in the church that, of course, we have Sunday, which is an attractional model, come and worship with us. But then also the pastor then goes to his office and sits in his office. He says, we need to get past that. The pastor better would be if he goes to Starbucks and sits down with his computer and prepares his sermon in Starbucks. So that somebody sees him reading the Word of God and walks up to him and says, what's that book? What are you doing? Why are you wearing that funny collar? 
And it opens the conversation and allows you then to be able to talk to somebody who's probably never going to come to your church unless you befriend them out in the world first. Something fascinating has happened, and that is that Flavio meant, gave a beautiful word when he said, disciples, temples don't make disciples. Disciples make temples. And I think that's really, really important for us. We are a group of Christians that have lost our temples, many of us. And instead of seeing that as a detriment, and I'll be honest with you, Anglicans love our stuff. We worship with our stuff. We worship with chalices, and we worship with candlesticks, and bishops carry sticks, and we put robes on that are all colors, and I mean, and it all means stuff, and we all love it, and we love our stained glass windows and our big organs and all that stuff, but let's be honest, most of us have walked away from that. And we've seen that then as brokenness. I think it's an opportunity. I think it's an opportunity for us to go to get out of the buildings and get out into the world and be making a difference. When you talk to kids, young people, the kind of folks that Travis is trying to get into the church, one of the first things they said is, if your church building was shut down tomorrow, would the community know that it made a difference? Is your church doing so much in the community that if they shut your church down, <coughs> people would miss it? If they miss it, that's great. That means you've been on mission. That means you're making a difference in the community where you live. But if they shut your church down and nobody even notices, we're not being missional. And I think that's the call, my call. I think that's the call of canoeing the mountains is that we've got to learn to be missional all over again. I want to give you a danger of Anglicanism. I've been called not a real Anglican many times. And that's because I tend to go into a church and I want to look at the culture of the church and the culture of the community and say, what is going to work in this particular culture to bring people, to help people come and plug into our church? How can we make a difference in the community? How can we be missional? And people might look at that and say, that's not Anglican, because they're thinking in terms of the old school model, which is, if I offer a certain service, the real service. Now, for some people, the real service might be the 1928 Book of Common Prayer. For some, it might be the 1662 Book of Common Prayer. For some, it was 1979 as the pinnacle of, of all godly worship in the Anglican communion. And some are looking then to as the new Anglican prayer book because it's going to be orthodox as, as long as we latch on to that. But it's, that's still an attractional model. I think we need to look at what is it to be an Anglican? And it's not to dress in a certain robe or wear a certain hat or use certain hymns or certain hymnals or certain services. That's not what makes you an Anglican. It goes back to something that Flavio said. What was at the heart of Thomas Cranmer? What was at the heart of the English reformers when they gave us a book of common prayer? It wasn't to say, this is the right one. This is, this is great. What was special about that book? It was in English. Yes. And the thing that made that special was they'd never seen that before. It was in Latin. And they didn't understand it. And so the reformers taking the Bible then and translating the Bible into the language of the people and taking the prayer book and the worship of the church and translating it in the language of the people so that the people could have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's Anglicanism. Amen. And they were using the cutting edge technology of the day, which was the Gutenberg Press. Now today, the cutting edge technology of the day doesn't look like the Gutenberg press. It looks like this. 
So I want to be an advocate that if we're going to reach the culture, one of the things we need to do is be able to use this as much as we can. And so I'd almost, instead of publishing a prayer book, then say we ought to publish an electronic version. And I could just see everybody sitting in the pews going through our... But at any rate, I think learning to use this and learning to use social media, learning to make relationships and connections with this past the screen, because this can also be a wall and a mountain and a Rocky Mountains too to prevent relationships. But it can also be a tool to break down the Rocky Mountains if we use it properly. Um, but using the cutting edge technology in the way that will speak to our culture the best and that's, that's why the question that Flavio asked is, what are the challenges of our culture? That's what we really need to be asking ourselves on a daily basis. What are the challenges? How are we going to adapt to meet those challenges to spread the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ in this culture? And we might have to ditch the paddles and the canoes, but we can do it. We can do it. And God will be with us. Any questions? We'll be working through this, looking for solutions in your standing committee. I'm praying that, that rectors too uh, will be doing that. I'd be happy to get a copy of this. Any rector who wants a copy of this book, I'll be happy to get it into your hands. He makes some great recommendations um, as to a, a positive way that we can canoe the mountains and, and get on the other side. Um, and get where we need to go, get where our Lord is calling us to go. But uh, can find it in Amazon? You can find it in it's in Amazon. It's in Amazon. Um, but that's our challenge: is we've got to be a missional people, and I don't see that as a curse. I see that as the Holy Spirit's calling us back to be real Anglicans, which is missional, which is reading our culture and doing whatever we have to do to reach the people in our culture with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think that's the heart of Anglicanism, and I think that's our challenge, and I think we can do it.